The thing that I may despise more than anything else about the U.S. political process is how long it takes for Americans to decide who they want to lead our nation. Then again, it's probably a good thing given the fact that so many Americans decide to vote for a political party without ever looking at the candidates themselves. The longer we take to decide, the more vetting that the informed public can do on their behalf, right? The primary season is starting, and so far there are over 20 candidates declared for president. I have to ask myself, and you, what standards we should look at first to narrow the field a bit. For me, that's fiscal policy, mostly because character is simultaneously the primary issue for those candidates who have no standing on the real issues, and the final issue which separates the nominees in too many elections. So let's roast up some candidates, shall we? Time for some roasted opinions. This presidential election season, the United States has an incumbent. So in my humble opinion, that's where we should start. Donald J. Trump is the most controversial president of the last century and a half, at least. Everything that he does is the subject of intense scrutiny. Every word that he says considered problematic by more than a few. Politics is often polarized somewhat in America, and President Trump? Well, he's probably the most powerful electromagnet ever elected. Politically speaking, of course. People love him or hate him, but I have yet to meet someone who shrugs and says, meh. Fiscally speaking, Trump is a political outsider and a businessman. He's also one of the toughest negotiators ever elected to the Oval Office. Thankfully, he puts America first, and in my opinion acts like it, no matter what impact it has on foreign relations. It's about time, too, because some of the previous presidents seem to be dedicated to giving away this country's position as prima inter pares, first among equals in the global community. Yes, I voted for the guy. He was running against Hillary Clinton. Trust me, I lived in Arkansas for years, and Donald is as pure as new snow compared to her. The stories I've heard from people who have watched her entire career curdle the blood. Yikes. Now Trump promised to make America great again. Fundamental to that was his promise to rebuild the economy and create millions of good jobs. Now let's see. The markets are soaring despite the expectations of economists. Federal receipts to fund the government are up. Tax rates are down. Employment is up. Manufacturing jobs are growing fast again. Yep, I have to give that one to Trump. On the other hand, the budget deficit is still out of control and the national debt is growing. That isn't a recipe for long-term stability. We need to get the budgets and the debt they create under control. Trump's approach has been geared more towards the long-term, if deficit reduction is still a part of his plan. We don't need long-term alone. I'm not sure that we can survive long enough for his long-term plans to take effect not at least long enough for them to kick in before another president tosses them aside in favor of buying more votes from taxpayers with their own money. Still, he has kept most of his campaign promises and has attempted to keep the rest of them. So, in my opinion, the orange man isn't bad. He does piss people off, though, including longtime party stalwarts. The Never Trump movement has survived a booming economy, and naturally, that means that the incumbent has a primary challenge. William Weld is the former governor of Massachusetts and a Libertarian VP candidate from 2016. He's seeking the Republican nomination, but his politics are as Libertarian as they come, really. While that may appeal to some, it doesn't seem like the best approach to building on a strong economy to flip the tables over. He wants to slash the budgets, which appeals to me, but how deep? Trimming the fat is one thing, but whittling the bones is another entirely. I'm not sure just how much appeal he will have amongst never-Trump Republicans, either. A few other Republicans are considering primary challenges, but as of this posting, none have formally declared themselves. Without a serious challenge, Trump will take the Republican nomination and Trump the never-Trump movement. That brings us to the plethora of Democrat challengers. 
Honestly, they've been popping up like mushrooms after a hard rain. At least 20 major candidates have declared, and over 200 others have also filed candidacies with the FEC. Now, I grew up in Iowa, and I'm used to broad fields of candidates early in the primary season. Election season begins the day after the midterm elections, where I grew up, with exploratory committees and fact-finding missions, and some person who has never gotten their hands dirty on the job in their life discussing hard work with a handful of farmers in the local coffee shops. Perhaps that's why I take such a keen interest in politics, but I digress. This field is too big by far. Half of these candidates will never survive Iowa, and the Democrat Party should be glad if they have just 10 major candidates headed into New Hampshire. The also-rans don't amount to much. But if more than 10 candidates survive the Iowa caucuses and head over to New Hampshire, then the Democratic nominee is likely doomed in the general election. Don't believe me? Take a look at these results from a poll conducted on MSN featuring head-to-head matchups between Trump and the leading Democratic contenders. Look at the sample sizes, too. That's more than 100 times the sample size of a normal, scientific poll. Looks like Donald Trump is polling just fine against the frontrunners. Huh. Why would this be, though? Let's look at the Democratic candidates. John Delaney comes across like Trump light, only a Democrat, from a fiscal standpoint. Why vote to replace someone with someone else just like them? Andrew Yang is offering to pay a $1,000 monthly stipend to several people to prove that a universal basic income is a good idea. I respect that he's spending his own money, but I cannot support a UBI. $1,000 doesn't go very far, and there are 127.59 million households in America. That's $127.59 billion to provide a UBI. Sorry, no. And how would he pay for it? A value-added tax. That? Um, no. Just, no. Julian Castro wants to rework trade deals as part of opening the borders. His approach is extremely globalist, so much so that I wonder if he realizes that he's running for president of the U.S. and not the EU. Kamala Harris has sponsored the LIFT Act. Essentially, this would reverse the tax cuts for the wealthy that were just passed in favor of new tax credits for the poor. It's as clear-cut a transfer of wealth as has ever been proposed. And pure socialism. Cory Booker wants the government to issue baby bonds to newborns. He also wants to raise the minimum wage to $15 an hour. I'm sorry, but giving away money that the government doesn't have in the first place is a bad idea as is hiking the minimum wage by huge amounts instead of letting the tight labor market drive up wages on its own. Tulsi Gabbard wants to redistribute the tax cuts from the wealthy to farmers and small business owners. Now that has some appeal, but again, I have to wonder if this candidate realizes that money doesn't belong to the government until it's taxed away from private citizens. Elizabeth Warren? On top of the LIFT Act, Senator Warren wants to tax wealth. That's right. If you have managed to accumulate $50 million or more in personal wealth, then a percentage of that belongs to the government. It's not your money, despite the fact that you've already paid income taxes on it. It's the government's money, and you need to pay a tax on it for the temerity of accumulating it in the first place. Amy Klobuchar, when she's not busy eating salad with a comb because her staffer forgot to bring her a fork, proposes to boost exports for small and middle-sized businesses. I'm not sure how that will help, given the fact that most small and mid-sized businesses don't export much. Bernie Sanders wants to give the entire treasury away, it seems. Ah, Bernie, you make me laugh. You're like a socialist version of Larry Fine, all bald spot and wild hair, and not a clue inside your head on how the government will pay for your proposals. Jay Inslee believes that fighting climate change is profitable and wants to boost the renewable production industry with government money. Jay, if industries can't survive without subsidies, then they can't survive with them either. John Hickenlooper is another one like John Delaney. He supports reducing bureaucracy but presents no plan to provide a viable alternative to Trump. Beto O'Rourke wants to bust up the big companies because reasons. He also likes to stand on restaurant countertops during business hours, putting those restaurants at risk of being closed for a health code violation. 
Next, please. Kristen Gillibrand. Parents who need to take time off for their kids would have all of the time that they would need. It'll cost us productivity and slow down both hiring and the economy, but hey, think of the children. Wayne Messam wants to think of the children, too, by canceling all student debt. All $1.7 trillion of it. Since the federal government holds that debt, that would effectively make college free for most people and treat a university education like a universal right. It would also foster another generation of people with too much education in the wrong field for their jobs that are available, which actually makes it harder for those college grads to find a good job. Tim Ryan wants to revolutionize manufacturing by fostering green industrialization in America. We've already had that for eight years under President Obama, of course, and it didn't work that well, but hey, maybe we just weren't doing it right. Eric Swalwell is another supporter of a universal university education for free. Europe can do it, so why can't the U.S.? I'm not sure that Swalwell has taken into account all of the other differences between the testing-based European system and the much more at-will nature of college enrollment in America, but at least it will cost the taxpayers billions of dollars to fund. Mike Gravel wants to tax financial transactions and IPOs to fund a social wealth program where have-nots will be able to tap into the vast, unused wealth of the haves. Think about that. Every time you swipe your card, you pay a tax to support transfers of wealth to the poor. Every company which wants to list their stock publicly will lose a big chunk of their capital raised. That'll stimulate the economy, right? Pete Buttigieg wants to double down on free college by also making health care free. Well, not free, but fully federally funded. Well, not fully funded, because the feds will have to dictate what universities and hospitals can charge the government, of course, but universally available, because it's not universally available if people have to pay for it. Seth Moulton is ready to save us from the end of the world in 12 years by backing the Green New Deal. All of it. The whole thing might just cost tens of trillions of dollars and effectively mandate that we tear everything down to start over from scratch, but hey... The world is going to end if we don't. A climate scientist told us so. Marianne Williamson would address all of the historical inequalities in America by paying people back for the injustices visited on their ancestors, starting with slavery reparations. She would then address all of the injustices going on now by paying reparations to everyone else. We can just print the money for that, right? Ah, uh, Joe Biden. Old Joe has run several presidential campaigns already, so all he had to do to get into the race was to dust off his old proposals and trot them back out. After all, they were successful at getting him elected to the vice presidency when he ran for president. Eventually, let's tax those with money to support programs and giveaways for those without money, because it's not really their money, is it? The government just lets them borrow it, right Joe? The fact is that none of the candidates challenging Donald Trump right now are very inspiring. It's not a case right now of someone better coming along as much as it is a case of someone else coming along. In effect, the 2020 election is a referendum about Trump's first term. The 10% of America which makes 90% of the noise in politics may not like Donald Trump very much, on average, but amongst the 90% who don't make noise, there's plenty of room for a lot of quiet support. There are now more jobs available for job seekers than job seekers looking for work. Companies are announcing that they will raise their internal minimum wage for employees to make sure that they can compete in a tight labor market. America's foreign trade partners are facing up to the fact that trade is supposed to be mutually beneficial, not just a convenient way to transfer wealth out of America to support the social programs and economic growth of other countries. The orange man might be the most bombastic man elected president in many years, but he does know how to foster more economic growth. Let's hope that the good economy continues beyond 2020, shall we?